Breaking news tonight, a Malaysia Airlines flight with 239 people on board, including four Americans, has gone missing. At this hour, a desperate search is underway for MH Flight 370, which departed Kuala Lumpur at 12.41 a.m. local time and was due to land in Beijing at 6.30 a.m. Air traffic control lost contact with the plane about two hours after takeoff. Whether the disappearance is due to mechanical problems, pilot error, or even terrorism is yet to be determined. Welcome to this edition of At The Mic. I'm your host, Keith Malinak, joined with my friend here, Zainab Yenisei. Uh, we've got uh, faceless Rob Borowski running all the uh, technical controls. And uh, and I'll tell you here, we have a special guest here that, I, that I'm going to introduce here in just a moment. But one of the things that... I know that I've done lately, and when I say lately, I'd say the last several years, I've really been questioning uh, everything, which I think is very healthy to do. And I recently saw a presentation of our guest here, uh, Ashton Forbes, who is also questioning uh, something uh, very important that I think that we need to discuss because there are so many unanswered questions around Malaysian Airlines Flight 370. You'll recall it disappeared without a trace nearly a decade ago, presumably over the Indian Ocean. And I've had conversations in my day job, Pat Gray Unleashed, where we've uh, talked with uh, aviation writer Jeff Wise. And he joined us uh, not too long ago and came up with and, and presented multiple theories on what could have happened with that plane. Well, I was on the Internet a few days ago. I saw Ashton's presentation, which was nowhere near any of the theories that Jeff Wise presented when he talked with us on Pat Gray. So I reached out to Ashton. I said, I'm absolutely fascinated by your presentation. Would you please do it here on At The Mic? And so Ashton Forbes, uh, thank you so much for making time. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to having this conversation with you. Just a, a, a really quick thumbnail sketch of Ashton. Um, he's in the IT field. He has a, a government clearance. So there's been a thorough background check on him by our federal government. So with that in mind, please listen to what he has to say and, and with an open mind. And, and I do have questions though, Ashton, that, that I'm sure we'll get to, but before I start asking any of my questions, please just lay out your um, uh, presentation, which I think, if I recall, begins with you stumbling on a video, I think on YouTube, back in 2014, shortly after Malaysian Airlines flight 370 disappeared. Is that accurate? Yeah, um, I remember seeing at least one of these videos back in 2014, um, randomly on the internet. I don't remember exactly where I had seen it come from. And I think that there was probably thousands, if not tens of thousands of people that have seen the videos back then as well that can corroborate this. But they reemerged on Reddit uh, about August 7th or August 8th. And this is when the communities, the joint communities of uh, Reddit, uh, Twitter, now known as X, and to some extent as well, even Fortune uh, looked into these videos and began to authenticate them. Uh, as the investigation proceeded, I started to post some of the content that had been done on those web websites, uh, repost that across Twitter, following began to grow. And as that investigation got censored off social media, I began to take the reins of it, started an organization called MH370X that is filled with volunteers who are dedicated to seeking the truth. And we have, I think at this point, corroborated nearly every aspect of these videos to be authentic and created a case that to date uses more evidence than any other story out there to present the real story of MH370. And that's what I want to present to you guys here today. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So so uh, that that video that, that really got the ball rolling for you back in 2014 that you said resurfaced just a few months ago, um, that, that we presume was was leaked from someone and and you actually have a pretty good idea as to who that specific leaker could be is that right 
Yeah, like I was saying, I think we've authenticated essentially every aspect of the videos, including as we dig through them. And I'd like to go through the evidence before we do that, because you start mm -hmm. to build a profile for who the person might be who would have leaked okay. these videos. But right. when we get to that, I think we'll find that even that part is very compelling, that we might even know who the leaker is of these real authentic videos. Okay. All right. Fire away, man. Uh, where do you want to okay. start? <laughs> So I think I'd like to start by breaking down the official narrative. Um, the official narrative says that this plane turned into the South Indian Ocean and that this plane was uh, controlled by the pilot, that they did some type of suicide route where they ran the plane out of fuel in the South Indian Ocean and it supposedly crashed down there. So there's a, a few major problems with this that you referenced Jeff Wise. I think that Jeff Wise is a smart individual. I also think that Florence DeChangi is another smart individual who investigated the case. I think that these individuals did not have all the puzzle pieces required to understand the case, but they knew that something was wrong. And the first thing they knew was wrong was that you can't have a 777 crash into the ocean without leaving a debris field. Mm -hmm. In 2014, especially, we have satellites everywhere. We would have found a debris field visible from space from the size of a 777 crashing into the ocean, even upon a controlled descent. We would have seen it the very next day. We This was the most expensive search and most extensive search in human history. The official search did not find one piece of the plane above or below water. They even searched with submersibles along the ocean bed, along the seventh arc, and all along the flight path, and found nothing at all. There was no black boxes found, despite the fact that these are able to produce a signal for up to at least 30 days at depths of 20,000 feet. The SOSA system, the same system that heard the Titan sub pop, where they had oxygen counters running on CNN and every other major cable news sta station for up to five days, would have heard the acoustic detections from this plane crashing into the ocean. The Navy lied about the fact that they had heard the Titan sub pop on day one and waited until five days later to admit that they knew exactly when it happened and exactly where it happened. There's also additional hydrophones, one in Western Australia, another one in Diego Garcia, that both would have heard the acoustic detections of this plane crashing in the ocean, which did not. There are two radar systems that would have seen it go to the South Indian Ocean. Indonesia has a radar system that would have been able to detect it, and Jorn, the Australian radar system, neither of which detected the plane in the South Indian Ocean. There were 19 families of the victims signed a joint statement claiming they were able to call the cell phones of the victims for up to four days. One of them even proved it on national television in, I believe it was China. This is not possible if these phones are underwater, if they have been turned off, or if they have been uh, essentially destroyed by the salt water, which would happen within 30 minutes to an hour. Some of the passengers were actually still logged in on social media, even after the fact. The location in the South Indian Ocean is on an active shipping route from Africa to Australia. The plane supposedly crashes in the morning, Yet there's no witnesses that see the plane there and nobody that finds any debris down there. The official narrative has the plane running out of gas. There is nowhere else for this plane to go. Some people argue that the ocean's really big. It is pretty big, but there's nowhere else for this plane to have crashed, at least not in the South Indian Ocean. The official narrative has this plane crashing at a 90 degree angle, which was impossible. And then they very quietly later on changed this to a 14 degree angle which once again is gonna crash and leave a debris field. There are four redundant ELT emergency transponders that activate on crash. None of them sent any types of signal. So from this evidence alone, we can conclusively state there's no possible way for this plane to <coughs> crash in the South Indian Ocean. Now, some people will come back and say, well, there was some debris found. You know, what, what about that debris? And I'd just like to reiterate that there was no debris found by the official search, not one piece. The debris that was found was found by third party independent people who had found it washed up on the Reunion Island, South Africa, over a year, up to 18 months later after the fact. When they did search, they, the, the official search searched with 42 planes and 39 boats from, I believe, almost 13 countries. There's no way they could have missed the debris field that would have been there. The debris that was found, the tiny bits, amount to less than 1% of the plane. You can go look at CNN's graphic on it. The three confirmed pieces amount to just a tiny, tiny portion of the plane. This is not enough 
to state that conclusively this plane crashed in the ocean. You need to find much more. There would have been bodies. There would have been luggage. There would have been parts of the plane spread everywhere. And correct me if I'm Some wrong. Some of the debris that was. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, correct me if I'm wrong, um, and, and perhaps you'll get to this, is part of that evidence of the plane could have been from any number of planes, correct? Yep, that's coming up. So okay, uh, the sorry. flapper on <laughs> that was matched, that was actually next. The flapper on that was no, matched. <laughs> uh, the only one piece was matched with the serial number. The media skirts around the fact that it was not matched with a unique serial number. The unique serial plate was actually missing. This delayed uh, connecting this piece, this flapper on to MH370. Some of the burn marks on it that were, some of the parts that were found actually had burn marks on them. And these parts had the consistent honeycomb pattern that only come from Boeing planes. There was, the, Jeff Wise, I believe, was the one who mentioned as well that the debris that was found years later is not consistent with the barnacle growth. There's very specific conditions in which barnacles grow. And for a piece like the flapper on, have the type of barnacles that it did have on it, was not consistent with the time that it spent in the water or didn't have any logical way for how it could have been floating through the water that would be consistent with that. There was another plane purchased by GA Telesis in October of 2013 that's an exact replica of MH370 that was scrapped decades too soon and also purchased from Malaysia Airlines as well. So when it comes to the official debris, what they have is actually consistent with the scenario that I'd be putting forth here today, which is a fire scenario from lithium, 221 kilograms of lithium ion batteries, as well as advanced technology that is equivalent to teleportation. Now, with that being said, do you have any quick questions before I jump into the flight path of what we think happened with MH370? I have a question. Mm -hmm. What about the phones still working like days afterwards? What is... What is the, what are they trying to tell people? Like, this yeah. is why the phones were working. Cause that, that's pretty, that's super weird that the phones were still working. I agree too. So apparently they had some CNN expert go on. I found a video clip of it. I haven't posted it on my Twitter yet, but that they claim, oh, well this can happen because it may have like been some kind of delayed still connecting to the cell tower situation, but doesn't make any sense because the cell well, tower the phone is, is off. Yeah. I, I would promise that if anyone tests this out, you're not going to have these phones ringing. Uh, I've never, I can't think of once in my life where the phone is rung when somebody's phone was off. Um, yeah. So I think that that's a big tell. And to me, what it comes down to is we need to begin again to use critical thinking is that when we hear people who claim to be experts on TV make bold claims, we should test those claims, not just take them at face value. So someone on CNN said, oh, no, this can happen. This can happen. Well, I'd love for them to have tested it. And I would maybe even give them the benefit of the doubt if it was just one or two phones. We're talking about 19 for up to four days. That's way, way too many in my mind to be just a coincidence. So um, it's just, I think, another piece of evidence that really kind of discredits the official narrative in a significant way. Um, good question, though, on that. Anything can else before I jump into the flight path? explain what, what you mean? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, can you explain uh, what you mean by uh, they were still logged into their social media accounts? Like, uh, how, yeah. how is that a tell? In other words, um, I'm just trying to uh, understand what that what you mean by that. Well, so I think the only way that would be possible with uh, if the phones are, let's say, at the bottom of the ocean is that they had some computer or laptop or something that's running that's online and they've got their Facebook or, you know, that like the Chinese version of Facebook, whatever on. Um, and the problem with that, in my mind, is this plane's going from Malaysia to Beijing. So did they leave? And most of these passengers are Chinese passengers. So did they leave their computers on when they went to Malaysia for however long they were there? Or did they have a computer that was on in Malaysia that was still running? Um, so there are reasons, I think, that do make sense of why this could be. But it just adds more weight to the evidence along with the 19 phones still ringing that, you know, maybe it's a situation where they were logged in on their phone, on their app, on their phone. And that that would be the reason why they would be on. Okay. So. All right. Um, so based on what you've already presented, um, I don't have any questions uh, yet. Um, <laughs> I think yeah. I will have plenty in a little bit. But uh, yeah. So, Wait, I, so I have one more. I have one more super okay. quick question. I heard something about there being an exact replica of the plane in storage in Israel. Yeah, I haven't dug into the location of this plane. And I think that a lot of I've heard that I think a lot of that's speculative. I'm not sure that that can be proven one way or another. 
Gotcha. So what can be proven is that there was a plane in October of 2013 purchased by GA Telesis that was scrapped far too soon. You know, it had a lot of life left in it. And that plane's location is unknown as far as I know. Mm. Yeah. So I think the idea there is if this flapper on was not connected with a unique serial number, um, it is possible that that could have come from another plane, that, that the serial number they use is just for that part, right? And so if it's another 777, it could have come from that. But the scenario that I'll put forth basically doesn't have any issue. There's no inconsistency with the debris at all. Is that if this plane just moves from one location to another location, that can still be MH370 piece. And I would even argue that just the tiny, tiny amount of debris that was found as shown on the CNN graphic um, really does not rule out us having this or does not confirm this plane having crashed into the ocean in any way, shape or form. Uh, OK. Yes, sir. All right. So Radio let's talk time? a little bit about the flight path. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Flight path time. Yeah, I'm a, I'll, okay. I'll, share, I'll share the video with the flight path as well. So okay. before I do that, I want to state that we have started by trusting all the official data. And then it was only as we systematically ruled it out as either being non-factual or itself riddled with inconsistencies that we've ruled out any data. So this, again, goes back to my point that I was mentioning earlier, that this story will use more data than any other story, including the official narratives to present a much clearer picture of what actually happened with MH370. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and share the this media that was put together by Chris of the Not So Deep podcast. Uh, he made an animation of one of our videos that we have. And in this video here, uh, we are gonna be watching as the plane the planes route up until the point where we believe the data no longer makes any sense. Um, and again, this is gonna essentially be ent entirely the official route that there, no one has any in issues with. Um, this plane is gonna initially take off from Kuala Lumpur and it's headed over to Beijing in China. The plane was scheduled to depart at 1630 UTC. It doesn't take off until 1642 UTC from the runway. And then it heads over to our first waypoint which is called the Igari waypoint. Now, as it gets here at around 1719 UTC is the last official communication that was released to the public where the pilot or co-pilot says, Good night, Malaysian Airlines Flight 370. Just 64 seconds later, the plane goes dark at 1721 UTC. Now, this is the time where the witnesses start to come into effect. At this point, we have a witness named Mike McKay, who's on an oil rig to the northeast of here, about 300 miles away, just in the farthest possible way or place that you could see this airplane still. He's on an elevated oil rig, and he's able to see this plane probably just on the horizon very low to the horizon, despite the fact that it is at cruising altitude around 35,000 feet. He sees it on fire for about five to 10 seconds. At the same time as well, there are nine witnesses along the coast from Thailand to Malaysia that report loud noises. This is gonna be consistent with the 221 kilograms of lithium ion batteries on the plane igniting in an explosion. These lithium ion batteries are very energetic and runaway lithium ion battery fires are a very serious event. It wasn't until 2015 where the FAA disallowed them to be in the cargo bay of passenger planes due to how many planes had fires on them and several cargo planes had burnt up. Many people died. So at this point, the plane goes dark. Now, if you read the Wired article that mentions an electrical fire scenario, it mentions that in the case of a fire, the first response is to pull the main buses and restore the circuits one by one, one until you isolate the bad one. If they do pull the buses, then the plane would go silent. The plane turns and heads to Penang, Langkawi International Airport. Direct shot. The pilot knew that the train was friendlier towards Langkawi, which is also closer than Kuala Lumpur. And that would explain why it doesn't go back to Kuala Lumpur. At 1730 UTC, just nine minutes after this plane goes dark, there's a communication reported by a 777 pilot who wishes not to be named, who hears the voices of either one of the pilots on board this plane, but there's not any other information that comes along with this. At the exact same time at 1730 UTC, there are eight fishermen on a boat 10 miles off the coast between Malaysia and Thailand here. They see this plane flying unusually low, which is consistent with the fact that the fire would have potentially caused a depressurization event and the pilots flying low not to uh, incapacitate the passengers but to give them enough oxygen to be able to breathe the masks on board this plane for the passengers only last 
15 to 25 minutes. So this plane then heads to Penang Lakawi International Airport. When it gets there, the co-pilot's cell phone pings a cell tower on the island. Wow. For whatever reason, this plane does not land at Lankawi International Airport. Speculatively, it could be that the landing gear was damaged. It could be that they were unable to dump fuel due to the fire scenario. But whatever happens, the next course of action after that would be to try to land in the ocean. It could also be that there was a communication was not disabled. We know that at 1730 UTC, there was a communication after this plane went dark. The Malaysian Minister of Defense had an interview with an Australian broadcaster where they claimed that this plane was unidentified, but they contradict themselves and say they knew it was a civilian airliner and they knew it was not hostile. As far as I can tell, the only way that you could know that it's not hostile and that it's a civilian airliner while being unidentified is if you had communication with the plane. Otherwise, you would no way you could rule out a hijacking scenario. So they do not send up any jets to track the plane. The same interviewer asks why they wouldn't send up jets to track the plane. The Mal Malaysian Minister of Defense says, well, why would we send it up? Why would we shoot it down? And she asks, well, you know, I, why would you shoot down? So he comes back and questions her. And then she says, the point of why you'd send up a plane is to track the plane. That would be the logical reason, right? To make sure you can find out where it's going, especially if you don't have any type of communication with it. So after this, the plane turns and now begins a direct shot towards the Nicobar Islands here. This is where more inconsistencies happen. The official narrative right at the next day, all reports say they lost contact at 1840 UTC. 1840 UTC is the time we believe our videos happen. It's also the time and location of where the official narrative says the plane turned into the South Indian Ocean at the Nicobar Islands, right around where this boat is. This was changed days later to claim that the radar lost contact at either 1815 UTC or 1822 UTC. It's still unclear to me which of those times they claim is the accurate one. Now, this is also the time where we have our next witness, Catherine T, on a boat. She was going from India to Phuket, Thailand. She sees a glowing orange plane come from the same direction that the official plane comes from. Her time, she claims that she saw this, is 1840 UTC or around there. It's not exactly accurate because she's on a boat in the middle of the ocean for days. But they had automatic GPS in her boat. They were able to recreate the flight path of her sighting with some level of accuracy. The direction of travel is consistent with the plane that we've seen in our videos as well as the official flight path. She says she sees a glowing orange plane with black smoke coming out of the back of it. The glowing orange effect would be due to the halon fire extinguishing devices releasing bromine, a halogen gas. Her visual sighting from her old blog posts show the plane being eerily similar to a, hal a halogen lamp, which is a glowing orange lamp. This is how we were able to corroborate as well the fire scenario. Her sighting also has the plane flying low with no navigation lights and descending for the duration of her sighting, which is about five to 10 minutes. So at this point, this is where we believe our videos kick in. Catherine T in the middle of her sighting goes inside to put the kettle on. When she comes back out, there's no plane there anymore. It could be possible that she just missed the main event of our videos. I've asked her personally, she did not see any orbs and she was not present to see the plane disappear. So now I'm gonna switch it over to the videos. I'll show the side-by-side -side version here. Now, what we're looking at in these videos, and we'll go into more in depth in a little bit, is we are looking at what appears to be a General Atomics MQ-1C Gray Eagle on the left. It has a electro, advanced electro IR camera that is capable of using its software to add a thermal layer over the top of it. That's what we appear to be seeing here with the HUD data removed potentially by the leaker. This would indicate that the person who leaked these videos is familiar with the equipment and how to add this layer over the top of it, as well as removing the sensitive information that could uh, compromise US intelligence. On the right, we believe we're looking at the SIBRS system, space-based infrared system. The system is capable and purpose is to track missiles, boats, planes, uh, intelligence, and battlefield awareness. We believe these systems are connected by SIGINT, Signals Intelligence, which is a network that the intelligence community uses, that the military uses, 
to have data transmit between these devices that can build this 3D battlefield map using the Cyber system. The Cyber system here is equivalent to a Google Earth video playback for the military, where they can pull back any time and location that they have data for and watch video in real time or after the fact. When we're watching this Cyber's video here, in the bottom left corner, uh, corner here, there is a designation. It says NROL 22. There is a debunk out there by Newsweek and France 24, which is objectively false, that claims that this designation says NROL 33. We can actually tell when we zoom it in that there are threes later on that we can tell conclusively the first two numbers are not threes, they're twos. So those debunks that are out there are false and they should be retracted as soon as possible. NROL 22 was sent up into space in 2006 and it may be the command satellite one of the earliest ones in which this new Cyber system was put into place. The coordinates move around when this perspective changes. When the coordinates move, we are able to rebuild the direction of travel of this plane. And it indicates conclusively that this location is the Nicobar Islands, the exact same place where Catherine T sees the plane. Now let's go ahead and watch this video. We see the same exact thing in, in two different videos here. We can immediately see the smoke coming out of the back of the plane. This must be smoke because these, these are cumulus clouds we see in the background. Cumulus clouds only form between 1,000 and 5,000 feet. We've also looked at the satellite data from NASA to see that this is accurate to the weather patterns that were actually there within one hour of this event. Uh, contrails only form between 18,000 or 30,000 feet and above. So these cannot be contrails coming out of the back of the plane plane is far too low as we can see from the side-by-side -side angle and from above. I want to point out we're not looking down in the satellite video here or up. We're not looking up. We're looking down in this satellite video and we can tell due to the formation of the clouds here. This is also not a daytime image. What we're looking at here is a, essentially a false composite from the computer program, something known as false color IR, where they're able to change the color scheme of the black and white to match what would be easier for a human to understand and be able to see. The time here that we believe this is happening at 1840 UTC is 240 in the morning, pitch black, as indicated by the witness who was there. And we've looked at the moon phases and sun phases to tell that this was there was not, no light source other than perhaps from the stars at this point. Now we see this plane turning left and descending. It is maxing out the capabilities of a 777-200. It is not exceeding them. This is extremely difficult to fake. Uh, a visual effects expert claiming to be uh, somebody who is the lead VFX expert on Top Gun Maverick said that whoever would have created this would have front ran their work by four years. And the most difficult time they had was trying to recreate the actual flight speed of the planes. They had to cheat it in that movie. So whoever would have done this would have been able to do better job than them and able to accurately recreate the plane's flight speed and direction of travel, uh, as well as knowing the location and the clouds in the area at that time. They would also have to do this between four and 72 days, basically making this an impossible feat to be able to recreate with this level of detail. So very shortly into the video, we see an orb come flying in from the side of the screen here. This orb is coming in at roughly Mach 3 speeds, 2,000 miles an hour. We've estimated this based on the fact that these pixels of the orb are moving about 10 times faster than the plane is moving while it's on its turn and its descent at roughly 150 to 200 miles per hour. The orb appears to be a completely ignoring gravity. It slingshots past the plane as if it was unable to target it at first, and then gets a better accurate target. It begins to circle on the side of the plane and then around the plane. The second orb is going to appear along the water, a little bit next to where the plane is right now. It's going to shoot along the water and up through this cloud and join the second plane or join the, the, the first orb. And the third orb will come in from the side of the screen and they lock in to a triangle formation. And then they begin what appears to be a pattern that has purpose. Now, these orbs begin spinning and rotating around the plane, which to me would indicate that they are mapping the plane, tracking the plane, collecting data on the plane, preparing it for what's about to happen. In the video on the left, we see that the plane moves out of field of view of the tracker. This indicates it's being manually tracked. It's not being automatically tracked by the drone operator. This is another detail that would indicate that the videos are authentic 
if somebody were to fake the videos, they are not going to have the plane moving out of the middle of the view of the screen. The, the user or the drone operator actually zooms in at this point and we'll see that the plane will come in with a much closer uh, zoom perspective than it did before. When the plane gets to the clouds over here on the right, we will see the orientation of the orbs change. Now notice there's a mouse as well here in the satellite video. This mouse actually indicates that the videos are authentic because this mouse has 24 frames per second, but the background is six frames per second. This is indicative of a Citrix session logged into an actual satellite database. The Citrix session is running at 24 frames per second. The satellite database, the Cyber system is running at six frames per second because it's a wide field of view computer program being uh, rendered in real time. We also can tell this because the mouse moves off the screen to the top left or bottom left and to the top right, indicating this is a cropped field of view of a much wider field. The drone in early on was cropped out. So it's very possible other assets were also cropped out. And the person that was leaking this was trying to minimize damage to US intelligence. What they were trying to tell us is this is what really happened to the plane. Because if we didn't see these videos, there's no way we would have ever figured this out. And this is, again, why they would have put the coordinates in the bottom left. They could have easily excluded the coordinates or cropped them out. They wanted us to know the location because the whole narrative of going into the South Indian Ocean didn't even come out until March 13th, 2014. The receive date on the satellite video on the right is March 12th, 2014, one day before the narrative of the South Indian Ocean was even developed. Now, when they get to the clouds, we'll see the, the orientation of the pattern change. Here's as well in the, in the thermal, we see a heat signature, the bottom of the plane. The most logical explanation right now for this is that there are two AC thermal uh, vents here that are releasing hot air through the bottom of the plane here. And we can see the smoke trail already at the side of the plane um, very clearly in our thermal right here. This lithium ion battery fire would be within some cargo bays that are contained and built for maintaining and, con and containing these high uh, fire events. The problem with the lithium ion battery fires is that they're very energetic events. You cannot put them out using the Halon fire extinguishing devices. You can temporarily keep them at bay, but over a long period of time, they keep coming back up and up and up again. So now also there's another clue here. They zoom in, collect as much information as they can about what's about to happen, and then they zoom out right before our event is about to happen. This is going to indicate that they knew that event was going to occur. They were filming before the orbs even show up. The orbs are moving so fast, this plane cannot outrun them. So it's not a situation where they were trying to get away from these orbs. These orbs would have easily, easily been able to keep up with them. This, in my mind, must be an operation. Now, right here, I'll try to pause it at the right moment. I missed it. The plane disappears. <laughs> completely disappears within the blink of an eye. The operator does not freak out. They are don't, do not begin to like rapidly look around anywhere left or right to find this plane. They just zoom out a little bit, casually go about their day, maybe sip their coffee. And then that's about it with that. On the video on the right, this actually, if you look at just this video, and this is not the original form of these side by side, they came separately. The operator who is looking at the Cyber system here zooms or scrolls over to the right to show us that this plane is not just hidden out of the field of view or anything like that. The smoke trail stops dead as in its tracks at the exact point where this zap occurs. This would indicate that it's not a cloaking that's happening here because otherwise this smoke trail would just keep going and we just wouldn't see a plane there anymore. The event that we saw here from the thermal is an endothermic event. It's cold. It's a black event. This may be why they leaked the second footage, because the first one's in a false color IR. So it looks white. It looks like it could be hot. But when we're looking at the thermal, we see the truth, that this is an endothermic event. Exothermic events are releases of energy. That would be a white hot event, like any explosion that we would expect. But if it's an endothermic event, it's a cold event, an absorption of energy that's happening. There's no basis for anything that we know of from the scientific perspective to even fake something like this. There's no way a leaker or a hoaxer could even think of producing half of the stuff that we see on these videos. We also do not believe this is an annihilation event. It still could be, but it's very unlikely. The reason for that is that the energy has to go somewhere. The size that we see of this zap here, right here, is not big enough 
for E equals MC squared. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Speed of light is a huge number. And when you square it and multiply it by the mass of this plane, this should have created an explosion large enough to destroy part of the planet. Think of the size of a nuclear bomb and scale it up to the size of a 777-200, which is massive. So this would indicate that what we must be seeing here is some type of phase transition of the plane, where it is, in our minds, obtaining the properties of quantum and able to speed off at potentially light speeds or greater, faster than the frame rate can even catch it. And this also explains why we don't see the clouds get blasted away or we don't see that the clouds get sucked in. This is not a black hole. It's potentially not even a wormhole. And that's why there's so little effect, although there is some effect on these clouds. When this zap goes off, it accurately illuminates these highly detailed clouds, which indicates that everything is real. It's not a composite that somebody has put in there, that this visual, that this, what we see, this visual here, is consistent with what you'd expect from illumination in the foreground and in the background on these clouds. And just as further evidence, this is not daytime. There are no shadows anywhere in this video. When the zap happens, we can see the flash. If it was the middle of a bright, sunny day, this flash would be probably essentially not noticeable at all. So there's a lot of evidence that what we see here is a nighttime false color IR, and that all the events in our videos here are authentic, hard as that is to believe. So my search has been to try to understand the science as best as I can, because I believe that everything we see in these videos can be explained by science, logic, and reason. I'll go ahead and let you guys jump in and ask some questions at this point. Mm, mm, mm. So much there. Um, Zay, do you have a question? I have plenty. Uh, so I yeah, I, <laughs> I have plenty too. Okay. Let me start with, I guess my most important question. Do you, do you think that plane teleported to a different dimension somewhere else in space and time, like totally, ripped through the fabric of space and time and went to a different dimension. Cle it's clearly not here anymore. <laughs> yeah, great so question. So where is it? And and <laughs> yeah. do you think, because this sounds kind of like the Philadelphia experiment to me, but on a more secretive and I guess larger scale, almost more advanced scale. Yeah, I think a lot of people brought up the Philadelphia experiment. That was something that I was um, kind of interested in since I started to research and look into UFOlogy on a not nearly this type of scale, starting in around 2017. Um, so if there is some type of teleportation capability, I think it would be worthwhile to look back at those type of past events. As you mentioned, I think there's only a few scenarios for the teleportation of where it could have gone. Um, another dimension, uh, it could go to another planet or another place in the universe. It could go to the future. So a lot of people don't realize that time dilation is real, mm -hmm. which means that the more mass that you are near, the slower your time goes. If you think of going near a black hole, that is going to slow your time down. Uh, just like the movie Interstellar, actually. That's the first time that I learned that time dilation was real. Is that Matthew McConaughey and Anne Hathaway, they go to a planet that is right next to a black hole. When they go back away from that mass to the satellite that they or the space station, this time on the space station has passed by 20 years, despite the fact that they only spent an hour or two on board that planet. That's how time actually works in outer space, space time, if you want to think of it. Time is a fluid symmetry, which can be bent and distorted by mass. It could then also just go to somewhere else on the planet. Um, and if it did, then it would experience some time dilation, which would most likely be proportionate to the distance that it traveled. So for me, I can't say I could only speculate in terms of where exactly it went. But based on the evidence that we have with the cell phones ringing, I would argue is most likely destination is somewhere on Earth and sometime in the near future, not sometime like, you know, 35 years later, like people have mentioned the show Manifest where the plane. Appears, I was just going to bring that up. I was just going to talk about that. But I, it does make it make me wonder about, you know, uh, art imitating life and life imitating art. <laughs> I think uh, it's soft sure. disclosure. It's totally soft disclosure. That's what I think about all of TV shows in Hollywood. Yeah. And I think a lot about Steven know. Spielberg in terms of uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. There's a lot of rumors that, you know, he was given real footage and told real inside information uh, that he included into those into that film. So I do wonder about that kind of stuff. But from an investigation standpoint, I try to stick to just the hard facts of what we know around this case. 
So I can't say exactly where or when the plane appeared, but I can give you those types of options in terms of that. Now I did, I have done some interviews. So I started my own podcast called Hard Truths. And I have been interviewing scientists and engineers and plan to interview more of them because I think that the most intriguing part for me is authenticating the science and understanding it. I think that what we're dealing with from a scientific standpoint here is stuff that's so far outside the realm of public knowledge that people have a hard time believing it. For most people, it's equivalent to magic. But when I talk to these engineers and scientists and physicists who are very intelligent, and very advanced, they tell me, no, it's not, is that it's simply either being censored by the government for national uh, national defense purposes or that it is just not fully understood uh, or some combination of the two. The more I've dug into it, I interviewed Salvatore Pius, who is somewhat famous for what is, I think, uh, incorrectly called UFO patents. But really, they're just advanced scientific concept patents. And I found him to be highly credible. I found his knowledge of physics, science to be extremely in-depth. And he essentially corroborates what we see in the videos as being authenticating his work, his research, and his patents that he put out there. Uh, I also interviewed Bob Greenier on Sunday. And he has been researching quantum uh, science as well as green energy. And I think the, some of the biggest takeaways for me, because these people are a lot smarter than I am in terms of the science for sure, was we had discussions over what this stuff could mean. He is what brought me back to the annihilation being possible. The problem is there has to be a byproduct. And what that would mean is that somewhere else, like some elements would have been dumped somewhere else in, in the center of the earth or somewhere for this to be an annihilation event. But the part about teleportation that he described to me is that this plane could be moved anywhere and it wouldn't have to be moved in a straight line either. You essentially can create this singularity, uh, which unifies the forces and then move the plane anywhere you want. And it can theoretically even be set down somewhere where it doesn't even have to obey the laws of conservation of momentum afterwards. I mean, that's not the right ex explanation. It's still obeying the laws of uh, conservation of momentum, but that this bubble can essentially allow it to just stop entirely and it can just be placed down wherever you want. So truly what I would think of as teleportation. Um, so is that uh, any follow-up questions on that teleportation side? I guess sort of it fits. Sorry, Keith, I have one more. Why, <laughs> why did this happen in this particular place on yeah. earth like why and timing yeah. why at this timing like does this have anything to do with like russia annexing crimea at approximately the same time and is this kind of the work of the ccp perhaps or is it like some other thing that's yeah. going on but okay that's I so yes yeah. <laughs> no you're fine I think the other part that Bob told me about was really interesting is that we might be able to use this type of technology defensively to just completely destroy any nuke or missile that would be sent at us. And I think that the people that are implicated here is, in my mind, the U.S. government. They're the ones filming it on two cameras. I can't rule out other people's involvement. I can't rule out non-human intelligence involvement. But to me, the most logical explanation, based on the fact they're filming ahead of time, seems like they know what's going to happen, is that this is U.S. technology. Whoever controls this technology controls, has military supremacy of the world. Um, it's just that advanced. It has that many implications to it. You can create doomsday weapons with this. You can have ultimate defense with this. You can warp a nuke onto somebody with this type of technology. Um, in terms of the motive for it, the most logical motive based on what we know about this plane is um, to save the passengers, that somebody or some people on this plane are high value and they <laughs> can't afford to be lost. Um, and that's because this technology is so risky to deploy what Bob Greener even said, and I think what people have argued is, well, um, and maybe it wasn't Bob Greener in this particular case, is this is a trump card. You only play this card when you really need to, because the moment you play it, you've revealed the technology and you've revealed your card. So if you're playing a game of cards here, you hold that trump card back until the last second, right? So are Same you saying this was more of something being done more than an experiment? Like this was not experimental? Yeah, so that's also a possibility. So I'll just run through my motive evidence. So. Okay. There are 20 freescale semiconductor scientists and engineers on board this plane, far too many for one particular company to have on the same plane. Most companies have rules that you can only have three or four people, including my own company, just for exactly situations like this. This plane was most likely doomed. It didn't land at Penang Lankawi International Airport. It was on fire. If it had landed in the ocean, it would have broken apart. Landing in the ocean is not like landing in the Hudson River. You know, Sully Sullenberger was a hero for being able to pull that off. I think that it was even trying to land in the Hudson River, there's a high likelihood of probability that plane would have ripped apart on that controlled descent. 
Um, many national Chinese that are mainland Chinese don't learn how to swim. So even if they had been able to pull this off, if these people had gone into the water in the middle of the night, uh, a lot of them, if not all of them, would have drowned. So in 2005, we found an NSA, National Security Agency, report that was on commercial superconductivity development, room temperature superconductivity development of microchips that references free-scale semiconductors by name nine different times throughout it. It's almost a report entirely about them. And even mentions that in 2004, they broke away from Motorola as well, which is the people that had that owned the batteries, the 221 kilograms of lithium ion batteries in the cargo bay. Freescale Semiconductors also launched a major initiative dedicated to serving RF power needs of the U.S. aerospace and defense sector in the past. So there's potentially a direct connection between the company, the people on board this plane, the U.S. military, as well as, again, room temperature superconductivity, which we think is uh, potentially the missing link in all of this, how you're able to pull off the singularity, how these orbs are able to freely float around and ignore gravity themselves. It all goes back to room temperature superconductivity, which if you, when watching and paying attention to, let's call it futurology, in the last few months, we've seen a uh, metamaterial known as LK99 emerge out of the east of uh, Korea and China that has been discredited in the United States as being fake. But I posted several videos which very clearly show a pl- f- uh, flux pinning event in, in reality, which I don't think anyone has been able to debunk. So I think that the people potentially who were not able to recreate it may not have the recipe correct, or it may just be getting suppressed for national defense purposes. But that will essentially enable all the science that we see in the videos to be authenticated. Now, again, with respect to the potential motives, I think there's three obvious ones that come to mind. Preventing the IP from going to China. These people are going to China. If they were defecting there, they were going to give them information. 12 of these people were Malaysian nationals. Eight of them were Chinese nationals. Again, because the technology would mean supremacy of the world, it could be argued that this would be a large enough reason to prevent these people from getting there to advance China, even if it only sets them back 10 years or so. Problem with this scenario is that this plane is potentially doomed. So if the plane is doomed, you just can let it crash and these people are going to all die. You don't need to deploy your advanced trump card. So to me, I think it's a higher possibility that's a possibility of losing this IP related to the technology and trying to save them. We see this endothermic event, this absorption of energy, and it's a very cold event on the thermal. This could be putting out the fire. It could be pulling the energy out of the, out of the batteries, which is what these runaway lithium-ion batteries, this is why they keep reigniting over and over again. It could also be a situation where it's able to put them out from the cold temperatures, or it could just be a matter of they're able to set this plane down somewhere, and then they're able to respond right away and have an emergency response right there and take care of this fire. The last one is what you just mentioned, which is, Something that was mentioned by several other podcasters, which is potentially, what if the government has a policy that they could pull out that says, okay, this plane is doomed. Let's go ahead and test our experimental tech on it, right? So, because even if everybody gets spaghettified or whatever is going to happen to them um, uh, when this goes off, that, you know, it, it doesn't matter at this point. The problem I have with that scenario is I feel like you just use a plane that doesn't have people on it for that. And then you don't risk the same issue of these videos leaking out in that scenario. But those are great questions. Do you have any follow-ups on those? Well, I mean, I I think about this a lot. I don't think the government or the entities controlling the government, I don't think they really care about harming people at all or what's going to happen to them. The only thing is the fallout that comes afterwards. Like their families are like, what happened? Where are they? But as with literally every single thing that happens, it it gets talked about for like a week or two and then it's gone. It gets memory hold and only a few, a few people keep talking about it and that's it. So they could brush anything under the rug, just like super, super fast. So I just think they wouldn't really care about harming people. Like you said, like they get spaghettified. So what, (laughs) but then like the videos leak and then the families ask questions. So yeah, that, that does poke holes in that. Yeah. And um, I think that the thing, too, that really corroborates the whole event and the fire event is this fire event is a very mundane event relative to what we're seeing in terms of the technology. So if it's just a fire, why this big cover up with the South Indian Ocean? Right. That's why the first thing I do is dispel this narrative that's out there, this pilot suicide myth and this crashing in the South Indian Ocean it makes no sense. But if it's just a fire, why why come up with this huge cover story? Right. Why not just tell the truth about the fire? 
You know, we've got 18 plus witnesses that all corroborate the same event. Why are they all being discredited? And the answer is because it has to be something huge, like what we see, this ad deployment of this very advanced technology that was used to, to do whatever to this plane. You know, maybe it could, still could be destroy it. Theoretically, it just seems like a lot. Like, I would rather use that replica plane that they bought, GA Telesis bought, and then I would test it on that, in my mind. Um, other people even speculated stuff like, well, what if the, these 20 semiconductor scientists were confident in their technology and said, hey, we'll be the, the guinea pigs for it, right? Like, fire it off on us. Um, and yeah, so, really, a lot of stuff is possible. Go ahead. So, uh, let's, let's visit the uh, 20 scientists on board, if we sure. can. Can you help me to understand what what was so special about about those 20 individuals um just help me understand who they are and why they're of such high value that that, that we would even yeah. know that they were on the plane yeah so they're not like cxo level c-suite people which i think if anyone has worked for a large company you know those aren't the people that know all the stuff about the company anyway it's generally the people who are going to be like your middle managers or your people who are on the ground floor are really making everything work. These people were headed to China because they were, at least the official story says they were going to upgrade certain plants there. So I've also heard uh, rumors of patents about advanced microchips, which is consistent potentially with that 2005 NSA security report. It's these uh, quantum computers are a thing that you've probably heard about in the last 10 years. Not a lot of people understand them, but supposedly they use uh, either room temperature or superconductive microchips. So we could be talking about a situation where this company was involved in developing the microchips for quantum computers that can enable uh, huge amounts of processing in these computers. These are what these supercomputers, I believe, are using. Google has a, a large one as well. Um, so to me, that's what we're talking about in terms of motive is it has to be related to room temperature superconductivity either for the microchips. And these microchips could even be used in these orbs that we see. What we're seeing with those orbs is a plasma field around them. There's most likely a very small amount of mass inside there that is creating a very powerful gravitational wave, if you want to think of it, um, that is able to create a field that separates it from space time, as we would think of it. And what we're seeing there is uh, where space time is connecting with the field that it's creating. And that's why we see this orb. So if, if the plan is for the U.S. government to prevent these scientists from arriving in China, mm -hmm. then if it's a mundane flight, could they deploy this technology on its normal flight pattern as opposed to, like, I'm trying to figure out if, if is the fire on board, is that like a hiccup in the, in the ultimate plan uh, that kind of yeah. causes a, a change on the fly? Um, or is that, or, or was that the original uh, attempt to bring the plane down? Uh, because I'm with Zay, I, I don't think our government cares who lives or who <laughs> dies. And I just wonder, was that was that some sort? And when yeah. that didn't work, when it didn't seem like that was going to work, did they employ this technology? Yeah, I'm, I agree with you. I, I, I'm very distrustful of the government. I'll say uh, that's the polite way I'll put it. But I do think they care about people that they find to be high value that will be able to okay. advance their causes and their weapons and their technology, which is why I find that motive to have um you know a lot of support for it but I, the fire scenario is part of the reason why i think the espionage scenario becomes less likely early on i was all aboard the espionage scenario and i don't think we can rule it out we might even be able to state that this fire could have been intentionally started as opposed to accidentally started at 1721 utc when it begins um, there's also supporting evidence for the espionage theory which is that there are two fake Iranian passengers on board the plane who were for some reason very quickly dismissed, um, even though one of the lead scenarios was uh, hijacking. And they were on false passports, uh, stolen passports. They had changed their appearance. They're traveling together. They're spending thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars on plane flights and on stolen, pa on stolen passports to go to Beijing. When the cover story is they were trying to get to Amsterdam as refugees, doesn't make any sense since there's a direct flight from Kuala Lumpur to Amsterdam. There's no reason why you take extra risk flying through another country, especially one like China, where it just increases the chance you're going to get caught. There's a satellite, one of these Immersat satellites that never pings the plane, even though it's flying towards that satellite. 
And this is important because it makes tracking the plane very difficult without two satellite pings. If you have two satellite pings, you can tell the distance from each of them and you can exactly pinpoint, triangulate the location of the plane. It never pings one of them throughout the whole flight, which makes it very difficult to track. So you could argue that there is some type of espionage scenario here where it's possible. But again, it seems very complex to add this fire into it. If that's the case, I would have just teleported the plane over the South China Sea right when this plane goes dark, as opposed to teleporting it back over the Nicobar Islands, which are indicated by our video coordinates. Um, so, And that's too where if you look back at the official narratives early on, I remember when I was first listening to this, watching on the news, I couldn't tell what they were talking about, where the plane disappeared, what time the plane disappeared. And none of it really made sense. They didn't have all these flight paths. And that's why I like to go through and did that flight path explainer that I kind of did with you guys just mm -hmm. there to mm -hmm. really lay it out for people that there's like more than one event that happens with this plane. Like when it goes dark is not when it just is gone. It is like a lot that happens after it goes dark for people to really understand. That's corroborated by military radar data that was only released weeks later. And then they only released these Immersat pings like months after the fact as well. Now, if you're in a scenario where you are trying to get to the truth and you might have people in the South Indian Ocean on boats, right? Like our deserted island or something like that, that survived a crash. You know, you're going to release that data immediately, like the next day. Like why with the obfuscation mm -hmm. over it? And also they lied about knowing that the plane went to the Nicobar Islands for like a week. They didn't, they were searching the South China Sea and they had radar data that shows they knew it didn't go, it wasn't in the South China Sea, but they let people search there. None of it made any sense. And I think the Malaysian government was happier to be considered ignorant than to be looked at as malicious and covering it up. Right. right. I, I will say that it's frustrating that Catherine T uh, went in to deal with her uh, kettle. I, I, you think it, I wouldn't take my eyes off that plane. If, if I saw a glowing plane on the horizon, I, I don't care what's going on down in the boat. I'm, I'm not taking my eyes off of this event. Uh, so that's frustrating. Can I just, just a little housekeeping, would you mind sure. Ashton putting up those two images again, uh, specifically the, the black and white one? Uh, yeah, the, uh, yeah, yeah. because I'll do, I want, I'll do, we'll do one at a time. Let me pull them Okay. Up. Cause I just want you to be able to address something on the black and white one. Sure. Uh, pull it up here. So this is that, the first version of the video that was released. This was the very first one. And this was posted by Regicide Anon. Um, it has description March 12th, 2014, which is just four days after the plane went missing. It says published May 19th, 2014. So when I spoke to Kim.com about this a few days ago, he mentioned that it's possible that this was actually uploaded, but not published to be made publicly available um, for weeks later. And my argument has always been that the only reason why I could think of that delay is that they had to be convinced that th what they were looking at was real as well. If I had looked at this uh -huh. in March 2014, I would have no idea what I'm even looking at. A lot of people think you're looking up right. in this video. And uh, so I would say, and it also said source protected. The registered non account was a random UFO uploader. They posted other stuff that's not nearly as high quality or detailed or as um, intense in terms of these videos. And so I think that they had to be convinced that this was leaked to them by somebody that was mm -hmm. had to conv like convince their credentials were real, that was really a U.S. military asset, and say, here's the true fate of MH370. They may not even have been told it was MH370 right away because the first video just says satellite video, airliner, and UFOs. I also think that the person that leaked this, they might not even have known the technology was our technology. They might have thought that this is really UFOs and right. that would be the reason why they would leak it because they're thinking, oh, it's not going to damage U.S. intelligence. And then they get told later on, hey, this was our technology. You just screwed us over. You just showed this to our adversaries, right? So it wasn't until yeah, and, three and days after this was uploaded, and then I'll let you jump in, that uh -huh. Regicide Anon made a Twitter account on May 22nd, 2014. That's when they said, watch this video before it's deleted. And they tag MH370 in their Twitter post. So go ahead. No, I'm, so I'm, I'm trying to get the, um, uh, you said France 24, and was it Newsweek? Is that the other one you said? Yeah. Um, yep. that, that tried, it, it, the, so the, the uh, what were you saying about the uh, bottom left-hand corner there? Um, yeah, and this isn't the higher the, quality one. Let me see. I, I have to pull that one up. Okay. I have a different link to that. And it's so. okay. I just wanted you to have an opportunity to to explain to someone like me that didn't quite follow that part of the uh, debunking the debunk. 
No, no problem. Um, I'll pull that up in a second, <laughs> but let me just finish, let this okay. play out while I'm looking at that one and trying to find it. Um, because there's an actual direct I mean, image that, that we have. Yeah, and we can tell this is Malaysian Airlines too because it's light on the top and darker on the bottom, which is consistent with the Malaysian Airlines coloring in addition to being on the known route and flight path of Malaysian Airlines at the right time yeah. in the right location. Um, so there is a lot of detailed corroboration. And this appears to be stereoscopic imagery that we're seeing here side by side. This is not duplicated imagery. We've proven there's parallax here between these. We actually were able to overlay these and convert this into a 3D video. You can actually watch in 3D with 3D with glasses on. So this here oh, is 100% wow. a 3D video. And I'll, I'll pull that one up too in a second. In fact, I'll probably do that while I'm looking for this video. So you want to watch the 3D one? You can watch the 3D, 3D version. Again, 100% proven 3D stereoscopic. Uh, whether or not this comes directly from the data from the satellite or if this was something that they did afterwards, we're not 100% sure. But we have proven this is definitely 3D stereoscopic. Do you fear for your safety, Ashton, uh, being that you're the spearhead of getting this information out there? And obviously, um, yeah. even let, let's say the whole thing's a hoax. Let's just say it is, mm -hmm. uh, which I do not believe that. But uh, let's just say that it is. And, and you're, you're making claims about u.s technology <laughs> that you know <laughs> that, yeah. that that i'm sure certain people don't want out there um oh, yeah. one way or another and I, I just i wonder if you if you're looking over your shoulder these days <laughs> yeah i mean i will say i'll be perfectly transparent about it and i'll present the other clip while i'm doing that is that you know early on um i was extremely scared uh let me make sure this is correct that's not the right one sorry hold on because i feel like the more you get people talking about this the better right yeah and that's, and that's what happened so you know after if you listen to my first podcast i ever did with investigate earth and i want to thank chad and sherry for having me on they were one of the first people to have me on um that i was extremely afraid uh oh this is why it's not working and i thought that you know, I was going to get, I didn't know what they would do. Honestly, I was never in the UFO community, never in conspiracy communities. I thought that U S government would silence people, kill them, whatever. I was very afraid that if I'm going to be the spearhead, they're going to come after me. And I, you can listen to my, the nervousness in my voice on that interview. Um, and I just knew though, like you just mentioned that I would want to get that information out to as many people as possible. Cause that would protect me. The more people that knew about it and that right. if it wasn't all about me. Uh, and so, the more, though, that I thought about it, and after about a week, I became very comfortable with the situation. First of all, I was fine with potentially dying over this. I think there's nothing more noble than getting to the truth of 239 missing passengers on board a plane for the families, the witnesses that were discredited, the you know world that was lied to, the leaker that may have gone to prison over this. Um, and so I've kind of just accepted if that were the case, then I would, I'd be fine with it. But the more I thought about it as well, looked at other people who I think are whistleblowers and leakers, what the government really does, I think, in the age of 2023, the age of social media, is they try to discredit people. They try to claim that they're crazy, try to find something in their background that they can use against them. Because when you can't discredit the evidence, you have to try to discredit the person. And I do think that there has been a significant amount of coordinated attacks on me by people who are potentially connected to the intelligence community to do exactly that. And I think that the reason for that is exactly what we're talking about and what you just described is that they don't want this information to come out. This is national defense purposes. This is why this is being hidden, right? That this information could be used by China, Russia, our adversaries, North Korea, whoever else, to create super weapons that could not just destroy us, but the whole planet. That's what I've come to conclude recently. And I question a lot, every single day. The question I ask every, and I've talked to many large, prominent people, UFO people, uh, et cetera, the question I always ask them is, if you knew that disclosure would mean technology that can destroy the entire planet, not just nuclear weapons, technology that can destroy the entire planet, is it still worthwhile to go after it? And I even did a poll on my stream just yesterday, I think it was two days ago, 75% of the people, and this is about what I get when I ask people, say that, yes, it's still worth it. And if it is, if it does happen, it's because of our own detriment. We still deserve to have be free of that information. The other 25% say, no, we should keep it hidden. Uh, I'm a patriot. I believe that America should have access to this and we should keep it silent. I think that's very interesting. 
and, and you've got to wonder, there's part of me thinks there's at a certain point, the United States may actually want its adversaries to think they have this uh, kind of technology. I mean, it's a fine line there as to when they would want that revealed. Uh, Zane, I'm sure you have many more questions. Let me let me just ask one more here um, before I, <laughs> trust me, I have more than just one more question. But one more question here before I, I hand it back to you, Zay. Uh, you, you talked about this, these videos getting leaked. Uh, would you please explain, and I, I, I was so, <laughs> I was so impressed with how you figured this out. Please take us through how you figured out or think you figured out who the leaker specifically was. I thought that yeah. your um, your sleuthing on this, uh, your, it's almost like you're a private eye, man. It was so well done. Can you please walk us through uh, that yeah. that experience that you had? And if we can share the screen, I want to show the, the NROL thing as well. Um, and, and right before I do that, I also want to comment on what you just mentioned, which is I think that I've come to conclude that since this was nine years ago, if we were able to figure this out with just a Twitter account and Google access using a small group of dedicated volunteers, Russia and China probably surely figured it out. And that might be part of the reason why I haven't been more you know, overtly silenced in terms of from the government is I could even be being used as a disclosure mechanism for all I know. I just Whoa. I honestly Boy. do not know, to be honest with you. But when you look yeah. at this, this is a screenshot from okay. the image yeah. in the video. And what's very apparent is you can see the 93 over here to the right, very clearly 93. And this is what the three looks like. These are twos that we're seeing over here on the left. This this three over here rules these out as being threes. Yeah. And I don't know how someone could even claim that they're threes. I mean, at a minimum, it would be ambiguous. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Right. Wow. The NRL 33 wasn't sent up until after the videos were taken post 2014. NRL 22 was sent up in 2006. So Newsweek and, and France 24 have objectively false debunks. That's the only fact in either one. <laughs> in fact, the Newsweek one was incorrect for weeks. And I was the person who posted on Twitter. You can find it out there uh, that their debunk was incorrect within one hour of them posting it on Twitter. You can still find my comment. And this was back when I had 30 followers that I debunked that debunk. So this is, again, another reason when I see fake debunks get posted out there, that makes me think that we're looking at something that they're trying to hide, not something they're trying to get out there, right? If they were trying to get it out there, they're not going to have this fake debunk up here one day after the, Reddit, the videos were reemerged on Reddit. It was August 9th, the day after these videos reemerged on Reddit. All of a sudden, a Newsweek debunk appears out of nowhere that the only <laughs> fact they had, they said NROL 77, which isn't even a real National Reconnaissance Office launch. And then they later quietly corrected it to 33, which is still incorrect. Even Tim Goulet was on uh, Chris Leto. And he was asked about these videos because I went on Chris Leto and Chris Leto was convinced that these debunks that are out there are false. He asked Tim Goulet and Tim Goulet goes, oh, well, I saw I saw a Newsweek debunk that said that that couldn't be the satellite. I'm like, how many people are being fooled by these fake debunks and fact checks that are out there? It feels like a lot. So. Now that that's being Sounds said, like Operation Mockingbird has been in full <laughs> tilt for quite a while. Yeah, and I'm not super familiar with all this stuff. Like I admit, I'm I'm new to UFOlogy and even the conspiracy communities. So I've been getting a, a full dose, uh, you know, catch up of a lot of UFO lore, history, looking, mm -hmm. you know, hearing stuff about Philadelphia experiment, all a lot of other situations that I never knew existed, um, as well as the science side of it, which has just been melting my brain trying to learn all of the scientific aspects of what's at play here but the part that i like too is the investigation side of it um that part i think that my analytical skills from my job uh carry over very well and i was sitting there one night and i was going huh i feel like we have a pretty good psychological profile the person that leaked these videos just from deducing how the videos play out assuming that they're real and even early on i thought that if these videos are real we should be able to authenticate every aspect of them, right? I mean, if they're real videos, you have to be able to compared to some hoax videos. And that's how I, I've just impressed with the, how the investigations played out. Never thought we would get this much evidence ever in a million years. Never had any idea we would figure out a fire scenario. I mean, I didn't even know that would be a very plausible one. I, I didn't even know how dangerous these lithium ion battery fires were. And so we're looking at it. We're realizing the leaker most likely has to be U.S. military personnel. We're looking at two different U.S. military equipments here, assets. They probably have to be an operator because they removed that HUD data. They probably had to be have an emotional reaction because it says on the registered version received just four days later. 
So they most likely saw and thought, oh boy, no one's going to ever be able to figure this out. They might have thought that we were looking at UFOs and thought, okay, I'm going to be a UFO leaker. They right. cropped the drone out from the satellite video, which was the first video that was released. So they might not even have thought about leaking the second video, right? They might have thought we have enough evidence in this first one. People will be able to figure out where the satellites are because that uh, trajectory data is amateur data that can be can be looked back even 10 years later um, with no problem. And they probably just leaked the second one because they thought, okay, well, you didn't see the first one. Now, do you want to see how these UFOs work here as these UFOs with these trails in front of them? And I'll show us that video in a, a second again. They thermalize it so that we can see very clearly the distinction between the black lines in front of the orbs, the black uh, uh, endothermic event that we see. We can even see a heat signature in the orbs. It's pretty amazing when we look at this high definition thermal. Um, so we've got this pretty good psychological profile. I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to look at anybody who has been charged with espionage, willful retention of classified data, or willful Love retention it. of national security documents. I find, and I, first thing I find is that you can't hide this information if it's an American citizen. Only during martial law can you hide these charges. So it had to be out wow. there, I realized. And I didn't know that at all either. So, you know, I've been a story of discovery in general. And I started looking back through everybody. It took me two weeks. Like I found all these popular names that you would find. And I was about to give up. And I started to say, okay, I'm going to start doing like date range searches because I figured it was, they probably would have had to catch them like very, very quickly. It's a Citrix session. They're not using a camera or a video camera or a phone when they record this. They're actually just using a screen recording. And all those sessions would have been logged. I would imagine they would have caught them right away. Right. And then the case, in terms of getting the case built, though, it could take a year, maybe even two years. So I searched between like 2014 and 2017. And then I find the guy, Lieutenant Commander Edward C. Lynn. And right away, I am getting like chills when I start reading about this guy. He, the first thing I read is there's signals intelligence on every single news article about this guy. As far as I can tell, this is the only person who's ever been charged who has signals intelligence all over. I found a different person that recently, I think there was a New York Times article back in like September, where they were charged with a, a contractor was charged with stealing satellite data. They were facing life in prison or the death sentence. So I knew that if this is real satellite data, this they're going to come at them hard. Like it's not going to be some one to two years that they're going to try to get them. So it's experience in signals intelligence. He was on this special projects patrol squadron, the VPU-2. His last deployment the dates start to be extremely damning it was February, 2014 to March, 2016. So he starts his assignment one month or less before Malaysian airlines flight 370. He gets reassigned March 25th, 2014, just two weeks after the, the plane disappears. The investigation began April 2nd, 2014, just a week after he gets reassigned. His next assignment after that is the brig. He doesn't have any other assignments after that. They're officially logged. He gets arrested September 2015 after the FBI runs a sting operation on him for a month where I presume they get him to sleep with this woman and try to have her tell him secrets or uh, him tell her secrets. In 2014, in May of 2014, he accidentally left two flight manifests in his flight suit from a deployment that included search and rescue code names. There is no other situation that I can even imagine that that could be other than Malaysian Airlines Flight 370. The charges against him, they tried to get him for life in prison over espionage. It was the first major incident of espionage by an active duty member of the Navy since the end of the Cold War. All of the charges, according to the defense attorney, was like misconstrued by the government intentionally to the media, which makes sense because for a situation like this, you need to obfuscate it. Otherwise, people are going to be able to connect it back to MH370 right away. The charge sheet is heavily redacted. They redact everything, including the dates off of it, the, t the names of everyone. Presumably, the dates would have been damning and lined up with the videos. But again, it's hard to tell. He was privy to the Navy's black program portfolio. He had above top secret. He had top secret clearance plus compartmental compartmentalized access to tons of information that would have been extremely useful to potential U.S. adversaries. So they had to be careful how they treated this guy and make sure he stayed in prison. In fact, when he was, uh, they, when I found re more recent information, it's not even on my current document that shows that they didn't, they wouldn't tell him what he was being charged with when they were interrogating him, uh, and that they kept him in uh, pretrial detainment, even though there was no evidence released from the judge in terms of 
why he was like a danger to release more information. Everything that they released about him was very mundane. They wouldn't release any of the damaging information about him, but claim that, you know, he did so much damage to the U.S. intelligence. Um, they eventually admitted it was not really a spy case. There's an article about there about the strange case of Lieutenant Commander Edward C. Lynn, where the government became, it became very clear the government was not going to have any information to be able to prove that it was espionage. There was no evidence that Lynn ever exchanged any sensitive information with anyone from China. Now, here's potentially the most damning part. The defense argued that the classified information available uh, in question is available on the Internet. When I saw that, I just thought, holy crap, how could it mm -hmm. not be the videos? What else could this wow. classified information that he released? That this is the only thing he ends up admitting to. They keep wow. him in pretrial detainment for 646 days where he gets abused. And he says that he's getting abused, directed by leadership from people who are called the goon squad who do all the stuff that you would imagine to somebody in prison. They ruffle his stuff. They take away his confidential information between him and his lawyer. They put him out in the cold. You know, the old trick of like, don't leave any bruises, but, you know, just kind of, you know, do abuse him as much as you can. And uh, he took a plea deal then so that instead of taking the life in prison, he gets a, uh, a sentence of nine years with a plea deal. They shave off three years because he works with the FBI and NCIS. Um, and then he ends up taking uh, responsibility for the charges of only the stuff that he was actually guilty of, which, again, the lawyer says is available on the Internet. So if it's not the video, someone tell me where this available information on the Internet that he leaked <laughs> really is. Right. I can't think of anything else that could could uh, warrant nine years in prison. If you look at other people that got like mishandling classified information, they didn't get nearly this much the type of a penalty on them. They get like one year you know, or less in some cases, very minimal charges. So you know what I do? Mm -hmm. I've been now learned how to Freedom of Information Act request people. And so far, I haven't got a single Freedom of Information Act request back to me that has actually given me any relevant information. Almost all of them have been denied. And the one to the NCIS is no different. The head of legal of, of information sends me the letter back saying that my request gets denied in total. They're not going to give me anything about the case. I requested every single document that's related to this case. They won't give me a single thing. They say that the reason is to keep secret in the interest of national defense or foreign policy. That's the rationale for keeping this secret. But it's not a spy case, right? He didn't get espionage charges. <laughs> so why is it being kept in secret for foreign policy? You the only thing em. I can think of is MH370, <laughs> right? And potentially the technology we see. The craziest part. They reference an exception, uh, executive order in, from 2009 that's from Obama era. The same year Obama actually loosened Freedom of Information Act requests. When I Google it, I see, oh, Obama loosens Freedom of Information Act requests, make them easier to get. And the exception is one of the rare exceptions that they allow it to be kept secret, either for intelligence purposes or, again, for foreign policy. So I'm just looking at it and going, well, I mean, this has got to be yeah. it, right? Like, Amazing. look at the totality of that evidence. Amazing. How can it not be him? I just don't get it. It has to be. Now, now, now tell the story about how you called his attorney. I love yeah. this. I mean, and how they communicated back with you. Yeah. So I like once I have something in my jaws, I am not giving up. So <laughs> I'm like, OK, we're going to call this guy's attorney. Right. I'm like, I'm going to get in touch with him. Uh, so I go ahead and I call the attorney's office. I called him on a Saturday and I get a clerk, right? And I say, Hey, I want you guys to call me back. I've got this really big thing. You know, I, I explain partial details. Another clerk calls me back on a Sunday. I'm like, you're calling me back on a Sunday. Like, okay. I like what law offices work on Sundays. Right. I thought nobody mm -hmm. would. So I talked to this clerk for like probably an hour. I explained the major details, the, you know, everything about it. And she's like, well, I'm going to follow you on Twitter now. Right? <laughs> and I'm like, OK, that's pretty cool. So, you know, I, I say that you need to get in touch with this, your your client. You need to get the lawyer to come contact me back. And I figure no matter how it plays out, I'll glean some information off of it. Right. Like they actually don't contact, contact me back after that. But I do get an email from them like <laughs> the Monday after that is from like a previous seminar they did a week more than a week before. It actually talks about the implications of the new whistleblower law that's been going through Congress and the Senate in terms of what it means for people that were charged with under uh, court martials. And I'm just sitting there going, is this are they sending me a sign right now? I've actually gotten like exactly. there's only two emails from them since that was one of them. And I got another one 
which was like I, I still can't tell if this was like they're sending. Why would be they be sending me marketing information? Like, doesn't right. <laughs> I didn't ask for any of that. Expired right? like, that, that had already and, expired. Yeah, right? and it was from a week before, so it's not like right. it was some upcoming thing either. Uh-huh. So I don't know because I did ask them, you know, send me a sign. And when I realized if you took in a plea deal, here's the thing. First of all. I would bet he would be very adverse to talking about the videos at all. He might actually have come around to the other side and decided this needs to be kept secret. He's already mm-hmm. done his time. Uh, we definitely did him a disservice because, I mean, if you just think about it, like these were out there for nine years and nobody was able to bring them up until like probably two years after he's already been released. My guess is the last thing in the world he wants to do is talk about them. And if he does, he most likely will go back to prison, I imagine, because of the plea deal. So, you know, I told him, send me a sign. And then I, and this still stands to this day. If he were to come out, I will use all my resources that I have personally, as well as my entire following to make sure that nothing happens to this guy. This is why I tell people and people who are listening, do not go hunting for him. We will only get him in trouble. If he would want to come out, he has to do so of his own volition um, and through his lawyers. And I hope that he were to, but I think that I'm not even sure the whistleblower stuff will protect him, right? I mean, we might be talking about a situation that's so secret that they would, you know, come down on him. It's super hard no matter what. I think the only thing that will protect this guy is a, a full pardon from the president of the United States. And in fact, I could not think of anyone, in my mind at least, that was more worthy of a pardon. I don't think that he had any ill intent. He was a guy that served faithfully for 17 years in the military. That from what I looked into his history, he was somebody that was being like fast tracked. For you know, upper management, we would say in the commercial space, um, and, and to me, he's a hero. He's probably my number one hero on the planet. To be honest with you, uh, I think that a lot of people from the UFO disclosure side talk about somebody would have to break their break the law in order to get information out there. I think he did. I think that's exactly what he did, and I think in his mind, he thought he was just releasing UFOs. I don't think he thought he was releasing information that was damning to defense. And so I, I'll say this again: I would take a bullet for this guy. And uh, if President Biden or anyone else from the administration or any future administration is watching this, give Lieutenant Commander Edward C. Lynn a pardon, reinstate his rank, and let him speak to the public. All he wanted to do is give us the truth. That's fascinating, man. I think you're exactly right. Zay, do you... Uh... I, I, I've kind of hogged the floor here for a while. <laughs> Anything on your mind that you wanted to share? Uh, I think your mic's muted. All right, now we're back. Okay, I have I have one thought that does get into more of the outlandish woo woo territory. Yeah. Oh, wait to hear my question. Okay. <laughs> well, um, first off, I think that this kind of technology is not human. I don't think it's human. I think it's some kind of non-human technology. And I think it may be used on a planetary scale. Like what so if you think our government's working us, with uh, with non-human uh, entities? You, you oh, think it's absolutely. like absolutely uh, like in conjunction? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. And I mean the people talk about it all the time, like the halls of the Pentagon are just full of aliens. Which I totally believe it. And I'm wondering if this type of stuff, like there's CERN in Switzerland, which is working on this stuff. Like, I'm pretty sure that this kind of stuff is being used on Earth. Like, it may have actually happened to us. Because I'm wondering, okay, going back to that show, Manifest, the people on that airplane that disappeared... They had no idea that they had disappeared. And when they came back, they felt like no time had gone by, even though it had been five years. So if this happens to us, like what if we were kind of zapped out of almost existence and then brought back, we wouldn't even know what happened. So is this kind of stuff possible? And do you think it might be possible with some of the more ancient civilizations, like for example, Atlantis? Great questions. Um, and I'm just going to be honest here about my opinions on it, right? And the first thing I like to say is everybody's free to believe whatever they want about the videos. Um, I initially thought it had to be non-human intelligence. We were looking at these videos just because of how advanced everything seemed and how much it seemed to fit directly in with UFO lore that I'd seen over the past few years. And I only changed my mindset from looking at the evidence and kind of piecing it together to realize there had to be human motivations to this. 
But I personally believe that this has to be reverse engineered technology for the same reasons that you do, which is that it's too advanced from what I think humanity could have achieved on their own in the same period of time. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm still a little bit on the fence on that because I think that this is from talking to sources and I've had lots of people now reaching out to me, people that I think are highly credible, that this could dates back to after the Manhattan uh, Project from the 40s when we split the atom, we dropped the nuke on Hiroshima. And uh, then from that point forward, we didn't stop developing, right? And I think that we got to the point where we are now. But even with that being said, I think the technology we're seeing here is too advanced for us to have naturally gotten to, and that we had to have had some assistance with that. Whether or not you believe that's reverse engineered or that we are somehow you know, working with these non-human entities or whatever, I leave that to the public to figure out. For me, it just comes down to having the government admit that that's MH370 on that video, which we can pretty clearly tell that it is on both of them and that they should just admit the truth. What I've been trying to do is stack the material evidence so high that there's very few narratives that they can admit to, right? They can't come out and come up with some other narrative that is inconsistent with the evidence. Now to your point, time dilation is real. So what you just mentioned is exactly how it would play out. If this plane was teleported a very far distance, the people that gets moved to at the speed of light like that are going to have a very, from their frame of reference, they will only experience a small amount of time. From the observer, our perspective, they could travel years in the future. Um, but, you know, again, that's all kind of, that is proven by the science. But what really happened, I can't really tell unless there's two more high quality videos on the other side of where it appeared. And when it appeared, um, it's just the physics basically turned into essentially magic where they can move this plane anywhere they want. It can show up in the future. There's even speculation based on actual scientific experiments that have been done that they might be able to hold it in superposition. That's the weirdest part to me is that they could hold it in superposition and release it later on whenever they want. So it could oh show up gosh. in the future whenever, anywhere they want at whatever time they want from our I perspective. That. I mean, you, I yeah, it's, 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 it's wild. You, you made the statement just now, time dilation is real. Uh, explain to somebody like me that isn't familiar with that concept whatsoever. Yeah. So the simplest way to explain it is that the more mass that we are near, the slower our time flows. So when we're near the planet, we experience slower movement of time than when we're further away from the planet. So if we were to move really far away from all mass, time is going to speed up for us. Now, this also can be applied to scales that we can see personally. So one exp uh, example I like to give is like a fly or an ant, which seem to move extremely high speeds it's because they have so little mass, they're able to experience time at a higher rate. That's the explanation that's been given to me by advanced theoretical physicists. Um, and again, going to the, the only time that I realized that time dilation was real, and I actually spent like a week tr like fact checking and looking it up because I couldn't believe the time dilation was real was when I watched the movie Interstellar, which I think proves it very well, which is they are on a, <laughs> yeah, you got to check it. out Interstellar if you have it. <laughs> okay. And this doesn't spoil the movie, but it's just where sure. they do it. And I'm like, wait, what? They are on a space station. There's three of them on a space station. Two of the people go to a planet that's right near a very strong black hole with a ton of mass. So much so that when they get to this planet, the waves are like 100 feet tall. And that's actually the emergency that happens to them is this huge wave is going to crash down on them. And they're told they can only spend a very little time on this planet because of the time dilation effect. They end up getting stuck there for several hours. So in their frame of reference, only a couple hours goes by. But they come back to the, to the, sat, uh, the, the space station, and the guy on the space station's experience 20 years go by. He's an old man at this point. <laughs> and so this is actually how time dilation really works because space time are one and the same. And what happens is when mass is put onto space time, it warps space time. And people also need to understand that our, the way that we get taught gravity is, is, I'd say it's true, but it's not accurate, is that when we're dealing with gravity, we're dealing with a field essentially that is, uh, I'm going to say the wrong terminology here, but as time moves forward, the objects are moving towards the curvature. So the explanation that I give people is that if we both walk in straight lines towards the North Pole, even though we're both, both walking in a straight line, we will meet at the North Pole despite the fact that we're in different locations. And that's because of the curvature of the Earth. The same thing is true for objects that are falling. The reason why they're falling and getting closer to the Earth is because the Earth is causing a curvature effect on space-time, which is causing that as those objects both move forward in space, 
Uh, I can't do that really well. I think that one of them is getting closer to the other. And the only thing that's moving forward is time. And what this may mean is that time itself is an illusion. It's that we perceive time as being a linear effect moving forward, yeah. right? But if you were to take our universe and put it in a snow globe, you might have a, a, an ability where, you know, time is now just a relative effect. And now time is something where you can look at it like an hourglass and flip it and do all types of weird stuff with it. In my personal opinion, it could even be possible that we're all the same person and that we're simply experiencing these lives in our own frame of reference <laughs> with our own relative time. And we're experiencing every life, billions of lives, maybe trillions of lives over and over repeatedly. Um, so that's where time starts to become very interesting. And this is See, also proven where like if those people who are by the black hole, if we're looking at them from the outside, from the from that space station, they're going to look like they're moving very slowly, like they're just in slow mo. And if you're the p person who's on the planet with the next to this very strong gravitational effect and you're looking at the space station, the space station is going to look like it's moving in super speed. This is the same as when we look at the fly. The reason why the fly is moving so fast is because it has less. Its time is moving faster than our slower time. And the reason why we don't see this more clearly is because we're all on the Earth, not far enough away to see this time dilation effect happening uh, as clearly as we would see from those examples. Yeah. And doesn't that kind of get into um, the difference between time, space, and space time? Well, it all kind of depends on the observer. Yes, exactly. And this is the reason why space and time are one and the same, is that they can't be separated. Because that really, when we're dealing with time and space, we're dealing with the same thing. Um, and again, it took me a while to understand like why time and space were not separate. When I was younger, I thought for sure they have to be. Einstein has to be wrong. Um, and then what this means is all we need is a unification theory of quantum and macro. Is that there isn't a difference between quantum objects and macro objects. The only difference is their properties and their behavior. Um, I think that physicist Roy D. Herbert talks about it as uh, dynamic behaviorism is that all we need is to emulate the properties of quanta and you can obtain the properties of quantum objects, despite the fact that you might be a macro object. So what this would mean for the plane is what's happening in the plane is the plane is entering some kind of singularity field, which is allowing its mass or is allowing to break away from space time as you would think of it. And now its time is sped up. Mass is reduced. Now it can ignore gravity. Now it can take a very little amount of energy to actually move it at the speed of light. And this is how essentially an object can be moved anywhere they want to move it at the speed of light and actually use very little energy to even do so by creating this new singularity around the object, around our plane. I have something to say. Okay, I've actually <laughs> never publicly talked about this. I've only like, told hang, my hang, mom and hang my go. friends. Hang on a second. Hang on. But, before you okay. do that, before you do that, let me ask one last question that I have on Malaysian Airlines uh, Flight uh, 370. Okay. Uh, and yeah. then, and then Zay, you take this to wherever you want to take it. Um, okay. Tell us, Ashton, the, uh, I mean, this is speculationville, obviously, sure. but um, talk to us about the possible connection that uh, MH370 has with the Maldives and the villager, the villagers that, uh, that, that might uh, have on this. Yeah. So there was a fire suppression device from a B777 that washed up just weeks later in the Maldives. This is, looks like a little acne bomb from those cartoons, honestly. It's a very unique looking device. Even has a serial number right on it. Um, some reason, the Maldives were intentionally excluded from the search. The Mal Malaysian Minister of Defense, who in my mind looks like a liar and talks like a liar, just says that, oh, that doesn't match, even though we can literally see it's a B777 fire suppression device. How does that not get looked into? Uh, there was a sighting from the Maldives on the, on the 8th the day you know the plane goes missing at 6:15 in the morning local time where a ton of different witnesses see a jumbo jet where they can see it very clearly see the the windows and they can see the red and white stripe of Malaysian Airlines on it again doesn't get looked into the official investigators all ruled it out for various reasons they claim it's not coming from the right direction right coming from a different direction be there at the right time but if a plane can be teleported this just right. brings it all right back into play right like it could definitely incredible. be incredible Incredible. I even talked to uh, Florence Achangi about this, who I respect highly. I think she's a very intelligent woman. Um, and I think she was just following the pieces of the puzzle that she had available at the time. But she mentioned, hey, they, they thought it was another plane that they were to figure out. So I've looked into that. And the other plane that has been claimed that this, they, these people saw, it looks nothing like Malaysian. It doesn't have any blue on it. There's no stripe on it. It's a 50-seater plane compared to a 270 you know, or whatever these 777s can carry. 
there's just no way they could have mistaked it for this other plane that was like supposedly in a similar area around the same time. So to me, I think that really indicates that this plane was really over the Maldives that morning. I mean, it's another strong sighting. And I've looked at all these other witnesses where, er, again, early in the investigation, I believed all the official narratives. I thought none of these witnesses had any credibility. But as you dig into it, you realize, wait, maybe we shouldn't be looking at these few rows of Excel data. Maybe we should be really looking at these witnesses and, and believing them, right? Like, well, they have no reason yeah. to lie. Right, right. Is And correct me if I'm wrong. Is the Maldives the same place where you noticed uh, in your research that there had been planes, I guess, based there? And then after the disappearance of the plane... Explain that the runway was devoid of planes. Is that right? Oh no, I think you're talking about Diego Garcia military base. Okay, I'm right? sorry. So people, I, I had a feeling I was getting it. Yeah, you're fine. Mixed it's up it's near you know, Maldives is very close to Diego Garcia military base, which is where when I'm on my research, almost every conspiracy theory. I was going to say that's a whole that's other conspiracy be. in of itself, right? Yeah, Diego Garcia. And I've been told that this place is Area 51 on steroids from sources that you know may or may not be true, but. I did look into find a bunch of contracts for dredging and other advanced construction, which you look at this place on Google Earth and it looks like nothing changes over time on this place on the surface. So makes me think that they have something underground going on there. When you get to 2014 in the Google Earth Pro pictures, all these huge jumbo jet military planes all just disappear off the runway. Um, and all of a sudden they're just not there anymore, which is very unusual in my mind. It makes me think that this is the perfect place to hide a 777 if you were going to hide it. We've got this sighting that's like just 100 miles or something like that away from this base in the early mornings by all these people. Um, that We looked into this base and found out there was no... We found a source that claimed there was no departing flights for 72 hours after March 8th as well. There's other connections. There's even a picture from one of the passengers, Philip Wood, that was supposedly put on 4chan uh, like a week or so afterwards that claims he was being held prisoner. He didn't know where he was. It's just a black picture. And the EXIF data points to Diego Garcia military base as well. A lot of this stuff wait, just seems uh, like. Mm -hmm. What was that last thing you said? Philip Wood had a. The Philip Wood EXIF a... data picture. It's it's hard to really explain and rationalize, but it, okay. it was posted on 4chan, supposedly by Philip Wood, claims to be held prisoner, that he was potentially drugged, he couldn't think clearly, and that he was being held captive in there. Turns out from uh, Black Vault Freedom of Information request. This place is or was a CIA black site, so almost certainly has cells in it. They at least use it to transfer prisoners, if not hold them there. Um, and if you think about the kind of implications of this, too, if anyone was able to survive all this, which to me seems like a long shot from a depressurization, from a fire, you know, billowing toxic smoke. Plus, we don't know if this is a, like proven technology or if this was an experiment. Seems really difficult for people to have survived, but if they did... You know, this is the place where every place pointed to it going. Uh, every conspiracy theory says this. It went to Diego Garcia. It's you can't land commercial planes there. It's got a protected zone around it. It has a runway that's an emergency runway for NASA shuttles. That's how big it is. And again, it has potentially this underground facility built into it as well, where you could hide a plane, you could hide passengers until you can figure out a way to deal with them. You know, either get them to sign agreements. So yeah, there's this Philip Wood picture, and the EXIF data says it's at Diego Garcia. Right. So, I mean, that's one of these things, too, that's just very from a circumstantial wow. perspective. I mean, I can't prove that that's where the plane went. But if I'm a gambling man, I'm putting mm -hmm. all of my money on Diego Garcia. I just don't know where else. There's no better place for this plane to be hidden, is my opinion, I guess. Yeah. And, and by the way, um, I, I will say that you're looking for allies in Washington, D.C. that will give this a fair listen and um, hopefully really make it public. Um I've heard you yeah. on other interviews um, say as much. I, I would try with um, Senator Mike Lee or Congressman Thomas Massey. Those yeah. may be the last two people that we have any kind of hope uh, in D.C. But anyway, I just want to throw those names out there for your consideration. I sent my letter to Thomas Massey, yeah, actually. Um, so. Very good. I don't know. We'll see if they ever respond. I was told that those letters would be held up by Capitol Police for like six, four to six weeks. Um, I probably they might be getting them now. I, I, I was calling a lot of those offices every single day and never got a call back. I mean, I don't necessarily expect one. Uh, mm -hmm. It probably sounds pretty outlandish. I mean, I imagine it does. But uh, I have been told that Congress is potentially some of the people that would be holding back papers, scientific papers, like inertial mass reduction papers that would enable the technology that we see. 
and that that would all be being held back from national defense for national defense purposes. So this is why I think the poll is so interesting in terms of should this be released or not? I imagine that Congress would not be allowed to talk about it and that they would all be, you know, sworn into secrecy about any of this, anyone who would be privileged to this information. And so we would need people who are brave, brave, patriotic Americans to come out and admit the truth on this one, you know? So I hope Congress yeah. does that if they know. Okay. Well, um, Zay, let's, uh, let's have this reveal uh, that I interrupted. Right. And I apologize, but uh, I want to hear this. Something you've never told anyone before other yeah. than who was it? Your mom or? My mom and some of my friends. Okay. So what? this plane, when it, right when it disappeared, those were those drones that were like circling around it, which to me, it looks like it's doing some vortex kind of thing, which brings me to this. When I was in Machu Picchu a couple of years ago, I was not on drugs. I'm just saying this now, not on drugs. <laughs> um, I was totally sober and I was not experiencing altitude sickness. Okay. So my head was screwed on right. So I'm in Machu Picchu. And my friends, I was with this group and my friends were taking pictures. So I was just standing there looking around and I turned my head to the side and I see this kind of vortex just a couple feet in front of me. Something is happening. The, literally the air, there's no reason for it to happen like that. The air is just swirling. It started swirling and it got a little faster, but not crazy fast. And then I swear I saw something in that vortex there was no one behind it it's, i didn't see like another tourist i saw something or someone in that vortex for about five seconds and then it disappeared what did it look like it, it almost looked like some kind of humanoid figure it was not and a person were, were like you afraid a person or, no or no you i i was this close to like running up to it because i've always Take wanted me. to see i want to see a ghost i want to see aliens like if i see one i'll invite it over for tea like i i want to be friends with it <laughs> but i thought okay if i go up to it it will probably like go away or something so i just stood there and looked at it and then it disappeared anyway yeah i think that uh you know, I like the idea of wanting to be friends with it. I don't think there's any alien invasion going to happen or anything like no. that. I think narratives like that are kind of silly. You know, my personal opinion is that if there are uh, non-human intelligence out there, they're probably not going to care much about us, but that we shouldn't probably fear them, right? Uh, they probably, my opinion is they wouldn't probably act or even care you know, for what we do. Um, but definitely we shouldn't fear them. And then I think through respect to your experience and what you've had there, I'm glad you were able to share that with us. I, I appreciate that. I have a lot of people who uh, share experiences and stuff like that with me. And I think that I hope that these videos being validated will vindicate those experiences and allow people to uh, be more willing to look into them, right? As opposed to write them off. I even want yeah, to go stuff like this is real. It's yeah. we're not kind of jealous. It up. I kind of jealous. I didn't have any experience like that because I'm, I'm like you. I would be all for something like that happening to me. Uh, I mean, I don't necessarily want to be probed. But I would like to at least, you know, <laughs> that's the best part. I'd, I'd like to have the vortex experience. Um, real quick, China, those were, I'm, I'm taking it back to Malaysian Airlines. I had another question pop into my head. The, the, those 20 high value individuals on that plane, like there's no coincidences. I think, I think we can all agree on that. Um, do you, and it's impossible to really get any information out of China one way or the other. But I wonder, do we know if they're pursuing anything? in Because these were important people to them that, that were on that flight. And especially if they can uh, even consider the possibility that the United States military is involved in taking them away, do we know if there's anything within China as far as pursuing leads uh, like this, as a matter of fact, uh, in trying to get to the bottom of what happened. Wasn't to that there plane? something about the some kind of patent? Like, yeah, the, there's. The I think the patent board? thing is a bit of a red herring because the reality is those okay. patents aren't controlled by the individuals. Like the company would own those patents, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's not at all related, right? It's still the same idea that these people would have this intellectual property related to being able to develop these patents. 
Um, the thing about China is that, you know, they control their media very well, though I would argue yeah. that we control our media very well in the United yeah, States that's as well. A fair point, man. Um, <laughs> but I think that for them, they, you know, we're not going to be able to get that kind of information out of them. It, it almost feels like they held uh, us over a barrel over this um, from just what happened after the fact with relations breaking down. Some people will argue that 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 our relations were already breaking down. That's that's fine. But, you know, if these passengers did live and you need to return them to China, now you've got to like come up with a pretty complicated scenario for how you're going to return them back to keep China quiet about this. And you may even have to let them in on it. I'm not sure. I even posted a picture of some Chinese satellite imagery that was posted that claimed to come from the South China Sea and claimed to be taken the day after the flight went missing. But the weird part is they looked and they didn't find any debris where they claimed that these were from. And when you look at these images, it looks like three orbs. Like, I don't know how else to describe it in a triangle pattern. And if this is spy craft to some degree, I feel like that's China going, hey, we know what you did. And it's just a direct message to U.S. intelligence, hmm. right? Saying, we know what you guys did. We can't prove what you did, but we saw something here. And then they leak that to the press, right? And then it gets, you know, claimed to be for debris. Um you know, it could still just be completely unrelated. It just seems in the light of these videos seems really, really odd. Wow. So, yeah, the China side of it, too. And I think a lot of people argue, I've even people mentioned, well, you know, couldn't China have made this? Or if we have this technology, don't we have advanced AI that could fake the videos? The issue with all of that is you need to give me a story that makes sense. Why is the U.S. government putting a U.S. military guy in prison if China made this or if Russia made this? If the U.S. government made these videos, what's the story that makes sense there? They didn't leak them to anybody. They just made these videos that what? They just implicate the U.S. government. If you were to show these on CNN, no one's going to think that aliens zapped a the plane. They're going to think that the government made these videos to implicate themselves or cover up what they really did to the plane. And the most important aspect is we never found a plane. No matter if how these videos might have been faked. How does the hoaxer know we're never going to find a plane nine years later? The moment we find a plane, all this work to fake these videos would be thrown right under the rug, right? So, or brush, you know, whatever, be um, useless. <laughs> so, you know, and I've got a thing that we won't go through right now, but the amount of requirements to fake these videos really narrow it down to it really only being be able to be created by the U.S. government or another foreign agency and using extremely advanced AI to produce it because there's no discrepancy on a single frame. There's no issue with anything from the respect to the videos. Every attempt to debunk them has fallen woefully short. And people have tried to manipulate the video, the videos and then compare them and say that, oh, this proves that there's some discrepancy. But you cannot manipulate the video and then claim there's a discrepancy. The moment you edit it in any way, shape or form and say it doesn't look right, you've already discredited your debunk entirely. Um, and that's every single one so far has done that. What yeah, I would say the is frame the only is incredible. Yeah, the frame sync thing is nonsense as well. The people that did that basically remove all as like they change the contrast, they change everything about the frames and then claim they're the same. I mean, of course, the plane is going to look similar in two frames. It's the same plane. So you can't do that as well. The only way and this is the only way to debunk the videos at this point forward, there is no arguing over it is you have to find the person that made the videos. You also have to bring the source material of how they did it. it would they'd have to have a whole hard drive filled with source material on how they produce this, right? So if you find that person, I'll be the first person to admit that they're fake. I found the person that leaked the videos because they're real. So the least anyone can do from the debunker perspective <laughs> is find it. They're going to instantly right. be famous, right? We've got, I think that these videos over just the last few days have got well over 100 million views. On my Twitter profile alone, I've got 13 million in just the last couple of days. So anyone wow, who's going to get have made these videos is going to become instantly famous. So this idea that this person's hiding out there, no chance, right? The, everything points to the videos being real. The only way we could corroborate all the stuff happening related to the case is because the videos are real. So that's the challenge I would put out there, guys. If you're a debunker, go find the guy that faked them. Bring us the source material. I'll be happy to admit I'm wrong. <laughs> Ashton, this is... Uh... Just, it's fascinating, man. And, and I appreciate all the time and effort that you have put in on this. I mean, God bless you, dude. Seriously, I just, I appreciate all the hard work because I, I can't imagine how many man hours you have put in to this point. So what's next for you, I guess? Just trying to get the word out and, and hoping that, uh, that this gets uh, more attention? 
Yeah, pretty much. I mean, if you think about it, like if the government's not going to respond, which they might not even be allowed to, if it really is national defense and these really are classified information, then the only thing that we can do is try to make it self-apparent, self-evident, is make sure that enough people know out there, they're convinced that are open-minded people that go, yeah, that, you know, the official narrative doesn't make any sense. We need another narrative to come out there. And then they're going to come up with another narrative, right? They'll have to. And, you know, if they don't, then that's the reason why I stacked evidence so high is that there's only so few narratives that make sense that if they say anything else, we'll be able to immediately discredit it. And I think that's part of the reason why a lot of official people and a lot of people that are prominent UFO community have been afraid to make any statements at all. They don't want to be seen as wrong. I think they know there's a high likelihood these videos are real. And if they were to come out against them, they will shatter their credibility. Um, and I think the people that have tried to come out against them, they've seen their credibility get shattered. And it's because people looked at the weight of the evidence. So the more and more people I can bring the evidence to, and this is why I would request of anybody who wants to help, a lot of people want to help. This is why I've pinned to my profile the all evidence version two. We'll make a version three in the near future as well. All you have to do is copy and paste that evidence. People ask about the debris, copy and paste that for them. People ask why I didn't uh, crash in the South Indian Ocean, copy and paste it for them. The <laughs> more the evidence gets out there, the more self-apparent it will be that the official narrative is nonsense and even if you can't believe in this technology, you can at least believe the government lied about it. Um, this will force somebody to, pay, to give attention to it. So I'm ramping up my production quality. You can see we've got a brand new camera here. We're in 4K high def or whatever this is. I'm not really sure anymore. Uh, I've been making, I've made my first video short today of the flight awesome. path so that people can share it more easily with their friends. It's like very abbreviated versions. I want to get them in like two to three minutes at the most. And I'm going to keep making those types of videos, uh, you know, going over the, the videos themselves. Uh, going over the flight path, stuff like that, Going to, probably going over some of the debunk attempts as well, just so that it is easier to get that stuff out there. So I appreciate everybody who's been, you know, assisting and following along. Absolutely. Uh, so, well, there, there's our uh, Twitter X handles, Keith Malinak, Zainab, M. Yenise, and Just X Ashton. Is that the best way, easiest way to get a hold of you? Yeah, the easiest way is definitely on Twitter, where I'm most active by far. Um, I'm also have a YouTube channel, which has already gained 7,500 or yeah. actually, almost 8,000 subscribers what, in just like two what, weeks. That's awesome, man. Give it's us the, uh, just X, they're all at just X Ashton. And I okay. also even have an Instagram that I just, I mean, I've had it out there, but I'd never had posted on it. So I'm starting to try to cross post it, and I think I'll be posting those video shorts on that as Excellent. well. That also has like 500 followers. Even I've only logged into it a couple of times. I love um, it. So yeah, it's growing pretty massively. Yeah. I've been doing live streams almost every day going over the evidence so that people can follow along. I think that transparency is really huge, especially Excellent. when you're dealing with people personally attacking you and trying to discredit you. The best thing you can do is show the work straight up, right? So uh, those have been fun too, just to interact with people because people ask a lot of the same questions you guys ask. Um, and I want to be as open and transparent and honest as I can with people. Well, I really appreciate you, man. I appreciate you just um, finding this. And as you mentioned earlier, you know, once you get something <laughs> in your jaws, you know, you're not going to let go of it. And I, I really appreciate that about you. And and please keep in touch. If there's a major okay. development or something that we need to know about, um, please. Uh, I, I know I've set my Twitter uh, to receive alerts uh, when you tweet. So hopefully I will catch uh, any kind of uh, new evidence or, or new developments in this as you try to, to, to get to the bottom of the truth, man, and, and make sure that we all see this. So thank you for all you're doing. Uh, Ashton Forbes, uh, really appreciate your time. Zay, uh, anything that you wanted to, uh, any closing thoughts you have for Ashton? Any more questions? Um, I actually, I, I almost have follow-ups for you, Zay. I just wondered if you had any other experiences since the the vortex thing, because we're going to need to follow up on that at some point, too. Yeah, unfortunately not. Okay. And it, al it almost seems like the more I want to see something, the less <laughs> it happens. All right. right. Which is really okay. upsetting. Like, I really want to see something, but it, it, <laughs> they ignore me. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, spending time with us today as well. And and Faceless Rob, are, are you, uh, are you, I feel like he's lurking back there and he's, uh, He's just uh, lying in wait for us to, to wrap this up. Anyway, there oh, he is. I'm totally, hey. I'm totally lurking. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, I'm always man. lurking. Thanks for making this possible, Rob, pushing all the buttons and making everything work. Um, all three of y'all, please you know, keep in touch and uh, let me know if there's anything big going on in your worlds, all right? Thank you guys for having me on. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Ashton. Ashton.